My name is Sherelle Cruikshank, and I am the proud executive director of Include NYC. And uh, as an organization, we are thrilled to be able to chat today with Quamel Arroyo, who is the chief accessibility officer of the MTA. So welcome. We will call him Q so that I don't get tongue-tied through this discussion. Uh, welcome, Q, and thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be sharing this space with you and, and in conversation with you and your audience. So as I'm sure you know, transportation is so crucial to everyone. Uh, New Yorkers depend on it very strongly, and the MTA um, gets us where we know, need to go. And especially for our people with disabilities, um, we support people with any disability, um, what not just physical, but it could be audio, it could be, um, it could be visual, it could be uh, developmental. So it's really important for us to ensure that our youths and adults that we support can get around. So why don't you start by telling us what led to your role at the MTA What's the significance of you being in that role? And what is your vision for accessibility for uh, our New Yorkers with disabilities? Well, for everyone, actually. Thank you. So, so the genesis of my role really stemmed with what's called transformation here at the MTA, where, as you may know, the MTA is made up of four, maybe five different entities, depending on how you look at it. And, and transformation three years ago was a, an effort to really consolidate the different towers at the organization and make one MTA that consisted of the Metro North, the Long Island Railroad, Staten Island Railroad, New York City Transit, construction and design, all coming together under one umbrella, one MTA. So that really brings up the profile of MTA HQ headquarters, which would house different chiefs, uh, we call them operational chiefs, uh, uh, of the entire organization spanning across all of those five different entities that I listed. So I am one of the operational chiefs under the headquarters tower for accessibility. So for the first time in history, do we have an accessibility executive reporting directly to the chairman and CEO at the MTA, creating an agenda for accessibility that's woven across all five of the operations that we have. And one of the Real neat things about me in particular being in this role is that I myself, I am a person with a disability. Urban planning is, is my background, um, but I, I did sustain a spinal cord injury 16 years ago, and I am a wheelchair user. I am a paraplegic, and, and it, it's really important that we have someone with a visible disability, someone who understands disability and the lived experience sitting here at, at the most senior table of the MTA and bringing that experience into to Broadway every day that I come here. And, and, and not only is that important because of representation and how much representation matters, being a person with disabilities and, and working with children and, and sending them a message that this could be them, that a disability does not have to hold them back, that they can be a person in a position of power, making change happen, making New York move, and, and I think that's the neat part about having me in this position here. That is awesome. We are happy that you are in that seat. We are happy for the, the thoughtfulness of the MTA uh, in considering all their users um, and especially making sure that access and accessibility is, is available. So in a granular way, can you talk about some of the accessibility um, changes that have been made for, you know, youths with disabilities, adults with disabilities, people that are using adaptive equipment, parents with strollers. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure thing. I'm, I'm happy to talk about some recent changes that we've made, but 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 I also want to finish that your, your previous question, which I just realized I didn't finish, which was, you know, what's my take on accessibility and disability and, and how do I interpret that role? And really, the job is to provide our customers the tools that they need to be successful when navigating our systems. And that is all of our customers, our children, our parents, our tourists, uh, our, our non-English speaking writers, our, our caregivers who are moving around with children or, or, or people in, in strollers and wheelchairs. And for me, you know, they're all part of my 
portfolio. They're all my stakeholders. I am not the chief disability officer. I am the chief accessibility officer. And, and, and to that vein, we've done a lot of really neat things in the last two years. I've been in the job for just over two and a half years. You know, one of the things that I'm most proud of, we, we finally settled a lawsuit that was going on before I got here for numerous of years around accessibility that, that now really dictates the work that the MTA will continue to do in the next 30 years to make the entire system accessible. Now, or people say, well, 30 years is a really long time. You know, already 29% of the system is accessible with, with over 140 stations being accessible. The first elevator went in the year that I was born, just 34 years ago. So in a truncated time, less than that time frame, I am asking New Yorkers to bear with me as I make the as we make the entire system accessible. And and, and we now have uh, earmarked $30 billion, a floor of $30 billion to retrofit the transit system, which is, is that, you know, any planners, engineers, or constructors in, in the chat, you know how expensive retrofitting is. We have a 119 year old system and we're working to redesign that system within that footprint that we now have to work with to make it accessible for all New Yorkers. But that doesn't mean that accessibility won't come for another 30 years. In addition to the 140 stations that are accessible today, we are making 67 stations accessible in this current capital plan. Over the next three years, you will see those stations come to life. And, and almost every other week, we're out there opening a new accessible station throughout the five boroughs. And our bus systems, I'm really proud that we have the first bus system in America to be fully accessible to New Yorkers with disabilities, even before the signing of the ADA. That's important because I like to remind our, our, our audience that even though our train system, our subway system doesn't go everywhere, we do not have transit deserts here in New York. We have subway deserts, but our bus system is completely accessible and goes to every nook and cranny throughout the five borough. And, and, and we are very proud of having that accessible bus operation. In addition to our paratransit system, which moves 33,000 people daily, the largest paratransit system in the world, uh, going back to buses, we we are investing a lot of energy and attention. We just carved out a space in over a thousand of our buses throughout 57 routes to create an open stroller space. So no longer do parents and caregivers have to balance holding a child with one hand and closing a stroller in the other to board our buses as it is policy today. At these 1,000 buses, you have a space that's been carved out for you to allocate that stroller open with the child in, if you wish, in there without having to close it. Because as I said earlier, my definition of accessibility very much does include parents and caregivers that move around New York City with a, a, a stroller. So, so, so that's just one thing. And when, I, when we talk about accessibility, you know, we are not just talking about ramps and elevators like it was the case before I got here. We are talking about a myriad uh, of tools that we're adding into our systems. You're seeing more tactile maps being introduced throughout the systems, more wayfinding and navigation applications. We are thinking of our cognitively impaired riders and providing them with instructions with a company called Magna Carta to help them navigate the system, learn about the system from the comfort of their homes or wherever they best learn so that they're not learning about how to get through a station when they're at that station surrounded by thousands of people overstimulated, overloaded by different sounds. You know, so we really are thinking about the user experience of all of our different customers. And for the first time in history, I am redesigning the fair array. And what I mean by that is I am taking down the turnstile and replacing those slam gates that so many people open and fair evade because they have access needs. They can never fit through a turnstile like me in a wheelchair. And we're providing new gates, new digital gates that are helping customers with the access that they need, be it a stroller, because they have a guitar, a bicycle, or a wheelchair like me. And, and, and we are testing new gates throughout the system. That hasn't happened since the start of the subway. So I'm really excited for that change. We're really looking at a, a, a new way uh, of delivering service. And it starts with our users. We are learning from our users. We're, la we're learning from their struggles today. And together, we are designing the transit system of tomorrow. That is really exciting. Um, I am really looking forward to seeing those changes come to fruition. I know that that means a lot to uh, the people that we support with disabilities. Um, how does someone 
find out what resources are available. Like if they need a train station that has an elevator or has a gate that they can go through or that they can get, you know, to the different levels or that where they can find out when trains are coming. How does the average person find that kind of information? So to be accessible to everyone, the best way to do that is online. Go to mta.info on the top left-hand corner, you will find a drop-down bar and the very first tab will be accessibility. And you can go in there and learn about all the different cool pilots that we have going on, all the different tools that we have for our customers to learn about elevator outages, you know, to see accessible maps of accessible stations, to learn about where bus stops are located and get real-time information. If you decide, text it right to your phone. When an elevator goes out at a station of your interest, be your home station or your school station or where you go to work or where you typically hang out, we can give you that information in real time. We can text it to you. And, and, and I, I love that question because you know, a lot of the gaps uh, in accessibility that I encounter are information gaps where our customers don't know how much we offer and how much we thought about their, their stressors and, their, and, and what struggles they face. If you go there, you will learn how to engage with me and my team. You will learn about our public meetings that we hold quarterly. You will learn about our active committee, our advisory committee for transit accessibility, and, and really learn of ways to engage with the MTA. We want to hear from you. We're not hiding, and it's only going to get better if more people engage with us and tell us what they're experiencing. So they'll be able to provide express their concerns and also provide suggestions if they feel that there's something that might be helpful to them? Will, will they be able to do that uh, at the website as well? They'll, they'll know how to contact us directly. Yes, absolutely. Okay. And, and you know, of course, just today, we have our committee meetings going on right now where the public is invited to come and speak. You can come and speak in person or you can come and speak remotely from your phone or a computer from your home, from work, wherever you're at. If you'd like to speak your mind, we're here to listen. That's wonderful to know. Um, so you have you sound like you have some amazing plans that's gonna cost a lot of money. And we have heard the mayor talk about the financial strains on the city budget. How does that affect your plans and, and does that create any obstacles um in creating these accessible tools for people? Well, luckily for us, you know, our reliance on city uh, uh, funding is quite small, right? It, our capital plan right now, the 2020-2024 capital plan consists of $55 billion, of which 5.2 are allocated to accessibility. And the mayor and city hall provided about $3 billion for that operation. Now, it is concerning when we think about paratransit, where city contributes about 80% of that operational budget to run our paratransit system every year. The city understands how essential transportation is to keep New York the vibrant city that it is today. So I have full confidence that the mayor and the city will continue to foot the bill and, and, and provide the resources to keep New Yorkers with disabilities in particular in motion and getting to where they not only need to go, but where they want to go. Okay, that's good. So you you mentioned paratransit. Uh, so let's talk about paratransit uh, for a minute. Um, how are the accessoride drivers um, trained? Um, and how can we make we how can we make that training better to support people? Um, there, are, as I'm sure you know, there are many complaints about um, paratransit, about accessoride, about lateness, about not showing up. How how can we bring this together more? What are your thoughts about that? Well, first I have to break down the paratransit ecosystem a little bit because paratransit as an entity, yes, is 33,000 trips a day. However, back in the day, 70% of those trips were happening in a blue and white vehicle, be it a sedan, a van, and only 30% happening in a taxi car. Today, 70% of those trips are in a taxi. 
in a for hire vehicle, TOC licensed and TOC trained brokerage vehicle, and only 30% is happening in those standard, typical blue and white vehicles. We were very intentional in changing that paradigm because in order to deliver better service, more efficient, faster service, we lean on taxis. You know, we saw taxis wanting more business with when Uber came in to town. And 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 this was a, a, a good opportunity to marry that need from the taxi industry and our customers who said, I want better service. This blue and white thing doesn't work for me. I want faster service. And, and taxis was a great way for us to deliver that. Now, with taxis, that really took away our ability to manage as much the training component because these are all TOC, Taxi Limousine Commission, licensed drivers who go through a training when they get that license and then they're gone out into the world. We are trying to bring that back. Um, we're trying to bring that back, working with David Doe and, and TOC, so that we can have a bit more oversight in the training that they get. We're also working with brokers directly, companies like CTG we're working with, and ensure that they deliver additional service for drivers who are going to do MTA trips. So in addition to what they get from TOC, they're getting trained by their home base, by their own broker who provides them with trips for the MTA. So we're really trying to learn more about what's happening in the street. But I come back to engaging with our customers. We put out a survey every month to about 3,000 random customers. And about a third of them come back. So what doesn't random customers come back and tell us that 76% or higher are getting great satisfactory service, that they are happy with the operation, that they are happy with the service. So when I hear that people aren't too pleased with the operation, that, that things need to improve, I, I, I really would want to hear from those customers and they should be reaching out to us directly. And, and, and one of the things that I'm doing that I'm laser focused in right now is creating a better platform for that customer information, for that customer service interaction and exchange of data to make it easier for customers to tell me when a, a, a driver goes above and beyond and is amazing, or when they could use a little bit more training, use a conversation, or help me identify people who shouldn't be delivering that service, who shouldn't be driving for us. We can get into those conversations, but it only happens if customers engage with us. And that's why we're investing millions of dollars into new oper uh, uh, operational platforms for that two-way dialogue. Okay, and and since we're talking about training, let's talk about travel training a bit. Um, travel training from the MTA. So who's targeted for this travel training? And does your training somehow mesh with training travel training that District 75, who supports um, many of our students with disabilities, does does it mesh somehow? So that we're all saying the same thing? The so travel training at the MTA has taken a bit of a pause uh, uh, around the COVID uh, era, and we are revamping it. In that revamping, I, I have tasked my team with doing some research around the country, learning best practices for what makes a really good travel training operation. And we're learning about the nuances about travel training and orientation and mobility instructions, which are completely different things. You know, travel training, you think about someone who's in a mobility device or someone with a disability, but you're not including the low vision and blind people. That's orientation and mobility training that they require. So we're really learning what are the needs out there? Who is providing those services in New York today for us to learn from or for us to say, maybe they should be doing this work for us. And one of those partners that we're in conversation with right now is indeed District 75 and, and, and the team over there to learn how they're doing it. In our minds, we know that we have a myriad of riders from children who go to school to seniors who go around their neighborhoods to stay vibrant and active. And we want to provide that training for all, all those all those customers for whom the trust isn't there, the reliability factor may not be there, the independence isn't there, but we wanna know what you're struggling with and we wanna deliver that educational component so that you can use that, you know standard transportation so that you can feel comfortable getting in the subway, 
getting onto a bus, getting onto an express bus, and that you do know who to call, where to go when you do need assistance, when things don't happen as planned. Okay, that that's good because travel training is really important. Um, and especially for people with any disability and and I think even more so when you have the invisible disabil disabilities like neurodiversity and uh, you know autism and all the disabilities that people may not see, but uh, they are still, you know, many are still living with. It's important to keep those in mind because uh, it traveling can be overwhelming for anybody, right? So I uh, always want to keep that in mind. Um, you There's a pilot program that was launched in 2017, which I know is before your time, but since you're in the seat now, well, I'll be asking you around wheelchair accessible taxis, which you were talking about, um, you started to talk about earlier. Um, I know that some recent changes have been made. Can you talk about those changes and why those changes occurred? Absolutely. So, so you're referring to our eHail on demand pilot, which was rolled out to about 1,200 customers, 1,200 paratransit customers with no parameters, no limits, no caps. It was use Uber, accessible Uber, um, instead of mass transit. Well, to be frank with you, 1,200 people is less than 1% of our paratransit ridership. Our paratransit ecosystem today consists of about 170,000 New Yorkers. And of that, about 60,000 are active users, right? And that one point, that 1,200 people is such a small percentage of the ridership that we never really learned how people were moving, what made people decide between one service or another. Those users who got that pilot were replacing mass transit with Ubers. They were no longer transit riders. They were Uber riders. And we are in the business of mass transit. We are not in the for hire vehicle business. So to really learn about what makes a customer shift the modes of transportation from a bus to a subway to paratransit to an express bus to a, ca a taxi cab, we are tripling that number of participants into that eHail on demand pilot program right now. We are in phase two of the program. So we're, we're looking for 3,600 participants to use that operation, but we have capped the service. We are limiting them to either 25, 45, or, or, or 45, 25, meaning 25 trips of $45 uh, uh, um, subsidies or 45 trips of a $25 subsidy at $4 that customers are paying for the service to that operation. And you have what phase two is looking like right now. And we're doing that because we want to see how customers choose between the service that they're going to use. What incentivizes a customer to choose a subway versus a taxi versus a bus and vice versa? And the only way for us to do that, to see that mode shift happening, was to introduce caps and, 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 and subsidies where customers who go beyond that subsidy, they pay out of pocket. Now, paratransit by law allows us to charge twice the price of the standard fare for paratransit service. We've never done that in New York. We've always provided equity and said, no, a paratransit trip is the same as the bus and the subway. This service is not a paratransit service. This is an accessible taxi. So it's not required and above and beyond our requirement. But we know that New Yorkers move all day, every day, and our lives happen in real time. So we want to see what it would look like. What would it cost us to do something like this for our customers, paratrans our paratransit customers in particular? And, and, and that's what we're testing now. We have a hypothesis. We have metrics that we are looking at. We have KPIs that we're analyzing. And we're looking to see how our customers shift uh, between modes. And, and it's not very popular amongst those first 1200 riders because it's no longer unlimited uh, uh open for everyone you know uh, uh, um take as many trips as you want uh, um it is a limited number 
And by the way, that is just a limited number on taxis. They are still able to take as many paratransit trips as they want. There are no caps on paratransit in addition to this service. So, so, so really, we are not constricting their mobility. They can move as often as they want using paratransit. This is in addition to that. And I okay. am a paratransit rider. I use it. And what we intend eHail to, to be used for, where eHail should be kicking in is when you have something un, you know, unplanned, when you have a service change in your day, I know what time I need to get to work every day. I know what time I should get here. So I could easily get here with paratransit. I could get a subscription service service that picks me up at the same time and drops me off around the same time to the office. What I never know is what time I'm leaving my house or what customers call the B leg, that return trip. And that's when eHail should be kicking in when subways or buses does not work. Okay. Um, I did want to just remind everyone on, that are putting in questions that we will answer your questions at the end because um, we want to get through a few more questions. Um, I did want to bring up that one of the attendees, um, one of the comments in the QA, Q&A said that there are many people who did not use the program as an Uber service and and feel that they are somehow have been generalized into the uh, group that somehow, you know, didn't utilize it the way it was meant to be used. So I do want to acknowledge that um, for um, one of our attendees. Um, so how long is the program going to run for? And when do we think that you'll be able to put out some um, findings based on, on your KPIs? So we said that this would be a six month pilot. Okay. And it mm -hmm. started when? So we changed this uh, about three months ago. Okay. We made we made these changes, and, okay. and you know we 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 see the data. We we see how all those users used it. Unfortunately, we had a handful of people who were costing the MTA over a hundred thousand dollars a a year in, in the number of trips that they were taking. There were a lot of people committing fraud, selling trips, and splitting the fares with the driver. And, and you know, now we have a fraud department to look into this and and, and follow through with, with necessary actions. But you know, we, we are analyzing this new group very closely to, to learn about how they are utilizing the system and how we may or may not be able to deliver this above and beyond service to our clients. Okay, all right. So um, I do wanna applaud uh, the implementation of Omni. Yeah, and it definitely does make it easier than having to look for your metric card somewhere and and all of that. So I do applaud you all for uh, putting that in place. And people do love the updates on new elevators and um the ele where where you can find elevators where the where the stations are accessible. But the question that I want to ask you is, how do you um, when you look across the five boroughs and you have multiple elevators that are not in service in various boroughs, how do you decide which ones to fix first? What's a priority? What's not? What's the thought process that goes into that? So, you know, we, we have about 359 elevator system wide right now. And I get a lot of, a lot of flack for it for, service outages and and everybody loves to compare us to other systems when the reality is that we have no sister agency in the country and i say that because no other operation is 24 hours like we are everybody else gets 10 you know eight hours a day to do maintenance to do repairs we don't have that luxury in new york because we keep new york moving 24 hours our outages are impacting our customers and there are outages that are known, there are outages that are planned. Today, I, lo I looked at the, the stats, we had 17 elevators out, out, out of service. I would like to say two because of those 17, two are in two stations that are just closed. The entire stations are closed. So it's not a fair outage to know. Of the others, seven are replacements where we are replacing those elevators because they reached their lifelines. And others are the others are planned maintenance work. So even though 
on my data sheet, it may look like 17 elevators are out. The reality is a different picture. They're not just out. They're programmed to be out. We know of that. And that's going to happen. And it will continue to happen. That is why we say to our customers that we will, on average, across the system, deliver elevator access 96.5% of the time. Because we need that, you know, the, the that three and a half percentile to do the work when they break down because of unknown things, when they break down for replacement, or when they break down for just standard wear and tear and maintenance. And and, and that's a, a metric that we meet, that it's a, that is the availability that we deliver our customers. And 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 we are we are doing that today. Okay. All right. And for um, and just in case people don't know where to find that information, where should they go to find out where elevators are and if they're working? So if they go to mta.info, drop down to accessibility, one of the tabs that will come up will be elevator escalator status. And that will tell you every elevator or escalator that are out throughout the system in Metro North, Long Island Railroad, or across New York City Transit, Long Island, Staten Island Railroad. And will that website, if they go to that same place, will they be able to find more information um, about, uh, I saw a question in the chat about paratransit service um, via the taxi e hail that you talked about. Will they be able to find out information about how to get involved in that as well? The paratransit site will be able to give you more information. Paratransit has a magazine called On The Move where they publish this, doc this information. And again, people can always reach out to us on Twitter, on Instagram, uh, uh, emailing us and, and express their interest. We are uh, uh, reaching out. We've reached out to over the 3,500 people to, to see who is interested in signing up for this program. I do know that there's still availability. And we are signing up paratransit customers. We are not signing up customers from the street who say, oh, wait, I could use a taxi. Well, sure, I'll be a paratransit customer to, for that service. No, we are working with our paratransit customers whom have established a ridership trend with us and we can see how they move. Okay. All right, that's good to know. So um, with New York City and its uh, surge with uh, immigrants and uh, the vast variety of languages that are spoken in New York City, how does the MTA ensure that they are communicating to their writers despite uh, the language that may be their, their first language for, for many people that is not English? So anyone who goes onto our website, they'll be able to translate that website into all the different languages that are spoken in New York City. In addition to that, the new tools that we are putting together and delivering our customers, tools like Navalence Wayfinding System, is transferable in the language of your choice. So we're delivering wayfinding information, not only for low vision and blind customers, but also for customers who are not English speakers. And that's why I am so proud of that service. And, and I keep talking about it. We're, 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 we're doing more than one thing. Now we, we are delivering for low vision and blind people while we also deliver for limited English speakers. And, and we're doing it all under one ecosystem, one application is delivering that same information in the form that that customer can best engage and interact in. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. So um, is there any topic that I have not asked about that you'd like to share some information about before we go to our Q&A? Um, well, you know, some, something that's very timely and, and lots of people are talking about right now is congestion pricing. Congestion pricing is supposed to bring $15 billion into our current capital plan. And, and I need all New Yorkers to support congestion pricing because right now paratransit vehicles are not moving at a speed that they should. Our buses are moving. You know, we have some of the slowest buses in the country. And that's because during the pandemic, New York City became the most congested city in America. You couldn't buy a car in New York. They're all sold. And, and, and that's now promoted a, a, a gridlock event citywide. So we really need to deliver on congestion pricing because the money from congestion pricing will deliver a lot of those accessibility projects that so many of your constituents and mine and I 
am excited about, but it'll also help us with our state of good repair work. You know, people talk a lot about the new things that the MTA is creating, the new access that the MTA is providing, but we can't forget about the existing access and, and the need for replacing that when those assets reach their lifeline. So I'm speaking about state of good repair, and that means money to replace escalators, to replace elevators, to replace stairs and hand railing, which are so essential to do more wayfinding and decals on the floor that market mark for our customers where they have a boarding area, a boarding, you know, level boarding platform with the trains. These are all things that truly deliver accessibility 360. And, and it is imperative that our customers not only support that, but, but, but are vocal about the need for things like congestion pricing, the need for state of good repair. Because in order for us to maintain the accessibility that we create, we have to get, maintain it in, in, in you know, a good state. And, and, and that happens when we invest in state of good repair. That's why 80% of this budget, this $55 billion budget capital plan is state of good repair. Uh, um, and it's really important. A lot, a lot of people want to focus on the new and what's different and, and what's coming. And very few people think about maintaining what's existing today that customers rely on every day to move around the system. And does your department partner with uh, your safety department, with the police department, you know, there's always a lot of concerns around safety on, on the subways and uh, safety as we travel. And um, how, how do you partner with them to address many of the safety issues that are out there? Well, that's a great question. You know, just at Committee, I'm, I'm speaking because that happened today. You know, right next to me, if anyone sees committee um, sessions, Chief Kemper is there with us every month. The NYPD Chief of Transportation, who is talking about the stats that his team are compiling, what they're seeing that's happening in buses, in subways, you know, at the bus lanes. And, and we talk about safety. And month after month, they praise the MTA for our keen uh, uh, um, interest in, in sharing information with them, sharing videos uh, uh, of people who do something that they shouldn't be doing in the subway. And it is because of our cameras and that video and our sharing in collaboration with NYPD that every time something happens within... 48 hours they've apprehended the individual because we have footage that we share with NYPD right away. We have over mm -hmm. 10,000 cameras system wide. Every station is outfitted with cameras. We're now outfitting individual subway cars like we have in the Long Island and the Metro North. And all that footage is available to NYPD. And we work okay. hand in glove with NYPD, the MTA police, ensuring that safety is our primary focus system wide because we want our customers to know that they can rely on us to keep them safe as they move around New York state in our transit system. That's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, nothing like collaboration to make our dreams come true, right? So I'm going to switch over to our Q and a and answer some of the questions that, um, that we got in the Q&A. So the first one, which I think we, we kind of covered was, how can a family of a young person with autism get their accessibilities met through the MTA? Please keep in mind, autism can be a hidden disability. Yeah, so, so really, you know, tell us what your needs are and tell us what you, you needs you have that are not being met right now. We are really trying to recreate an ecosystem where we have very simple information, simple text that's easily digested and understood by as many of our customers as possible. But we'd love to hear whenever, wherever we're missing the mark and what can enhance your son's experience. You know, if there's something that we don't know about, make us aware and we'd love to learn with you and, and deliver a better, a better service. Uh, so I think we did talk about how someone uses paratransit service 
via a taxi. You just had to go to the MTA um, website under accessibility and they would find that information, correct? They could learn about the programs that, that, that we have. Uh, all paratransit customers know that you know they can easily get subscription service and a lot of times that is delivered through a broker or depending on their needs, you know, they may get a, a blue and white vehicle. It's astonishing. 80% of paratransit customers do not require an accessible vehicle. They are perfectly fine in a sedan because they either have a cognitive disability, uh, they're aging New Yorkers, or they're low vision and blind. They have complete faculties and abilities to step in and out of a sedan. So, so, so a lot of those trips are happening in those taxi-like vehicles. Okay, great. So for paratransit drivers and the issues now, how are they trained on routes, on working with those with disabilities, given the continues, continuous issues that come up with paratransit? Well, I think this is a tiered question, right? There's a lot in here. First, the, the training for, uh, I, I explained earlier, those blue and white vehicles, we have a very robust training on, on those contractors who are working for us in our vehicles. And, and we have a lot more control over what training they get. The training that a taxi driver, a TOC driver gets is completely under the umbrella of the TOC and what they provide and what educational materials they deliver. We do try to work with them. We They do share a lot of their training with us and we tell them what we'd like to be involved and included in that training. In addition, we do work with specific brokers to deliver even more training on top of what TOC offers so that they know how to secure a person in a motorized wheelchair, where to secure those chairs, how to provide those seat belts, and the incent the importance uh, of all of these safety tools so that a customer feels safe. But on the on, on the notion of routes, you know, that's that's really specific to uh, um, the technologies. And we are currently in the process of updating the technology that we utilize here at the MTA. So I can't speak much on the routing system, but that's a technology solution that we're enhancing right now. Okay. And has there been, as a follow-up to that, has there been consideration about maybe making some training mandatory for for in your contract with third parties so that you know that at a minimum there are certain topics that are covered? We are in conversation. Um, that's something that we can do when we put out an RFP and, and we are negotiating pricing. Um, so that is definitely something that we will be considering uh, the next uh, uh, RFP that we put out for this type of service, absolutely. Okay. Um, thank you for that. Uh, we did acknowledge uh, the attendee who said that they disagreed, that not everyone um, falls into the same category, which you did clarify. So thank you for that. Uh, the next question is AAR pilot program customers are se selected randomly. Is this accurate? This is true. That's why I said you could learn about the program and you can read about what's happening, but there's no raising your hand for, for, for uh, being part of that pilot right now. And we are working with customers that are already paratransit customers. We are not really inviting new customers, um, new paratransit customers for this program directly. Okay. Are Accessoride Metro cards converted to Omni? So this is a bit of a tongue twister. Um, paratransit customers who use Accessoride do have an Accessoride Metro card, mainly because it's their ID that they have that they use to show a driver there will be an omni card that is provided for all paratransit customers that is currently in the works we should have a pilot within the next quarter for that with about 100 or so paratransit customers so that is something that is in development right now and, and, and we will be ecstatic to deliver omni to our paratransit customers in the coming months any other exciting pilots that you want to tell us about? Um, I told you about, oh, 
zoning for accessibility is not a pilot, but that is a new ratification to the building zoning code here in New York, where now any developer that's building near a subway station is required by law to come to us and deliver a space in their footprint to do uh, uh, enhanced accessibility, be it with new stairs, elevators, escalators, and in exchange, they get some bonuses for, for their development. It's really something really fascinating because never before had the building code involve the MTA in such a, a deep and meaningful way as zoning for accessibility does. And what that'll deliver is a faster accessible transit system that doesn't come at the expense of the MTA. So no longer is the MTA doing all these changes by themselves. We've also included the development community and that is a win for everybody. That's awesome. Um, I, I love the different ways that you are getting into uh, accessibility for all New Yorkers. Um, we look forward to chatting with you maybe in a couple of months after you've gotten your data uh, from um, the eHail uh, program and hear what came up and um, and and what what you're going to do to address those. Um, there is a question about in the chat. Let's see if I can get to the one new message. I, I see the question. The question is, is ASL or American Sign Language uh, a training included for MTA employees? And, okay. and, and in, in the similar fashion that, you know, our employees are, are, are not required to speak Spanish or French, this is something that we highly encourage, but my team is currently working to see how we may be able to leverage digital tools to help translate ASL to spoken and vice versa. That is a very uh, cutting edge technology that I'm very excited about. And, and in addition to that, I, how can I put this without saying too much? I am looking at other ways to engage with you. I think sign language is a critical uh, piece uh, of information, delivering information tool that, that has not been leveraged enough. So many customers rely on that, as you say, particularly in the subway system where there's so much noise and, and, and stimulation. So stay tuned for some really cool things coming down the pipe. I, I, I'm really excited to be working on this and I hope you will be happy when you see it live uh, soon. Ah, oh, that does sound exciting. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Sure. Um, I think we have answered all our questions at this point. I want to thank you so much, uh, Keith, for taking the time to chat with us, for your transparency, uh, for your diligence, for your focus. And um, we look forward to partnering with you as we can continue to provide uh, training, resources, information, um, be a thought partner with you in any way, um, share some information through town halls. We are open and willing to help uh, in any way that we can to help to get the information out. Great. Thank you so much. It's truly a pleasure. Cheers. Until right. next time. Take care. Bye-bye.